Hey everybody, so, you know, the party was able to reconcile after the exploding baby thing. Uh, it took a lot of effort and condolences on the part of the GM, but he was eventually forgiven. And, uh, yeah, then he realized that he forgot to prep a lot of shit for the session, for, you know, for session one. So he kind of panicked and then passed out, foaming out of the mouth like that guy from Avatar. So I, I guess session's canceled. <laughs> like the guy from Avatar. <laughs> Uh, good. Yep, yeah, good reference. Yeah. Uh, welcome back, everybody, to our 110th episode of the Sessions to Cancel podcast. Uh, it's me, your boy, Isaiah. I'm here with Josh. I'm here, but like, who's counting? Yeah. I mean, me. I just did all 110 of them. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, so I figured. <laughs> You know, we, we had our episode last week about Session Zero, um, which, you know, like I said back then, has everyone done that? Yes, but it, as Josh put it, it's also worth take putting your own spin on it because it in many ways is not a concrete thing. It's just a lot of like suggestion work. And then the one main thing being like, please discuss what the fuck the game is about. Well, you know, um, but that everybody has their own method and, you know. Uh, gives the sales pitch on their own version, so yeah. It well, it is a uh, you know a, a a beaten a beaten into the ground sort of topic. It doesn't mean it's not like we're still talking about in some capacity. <laughs> but uh, that got me thinking. People talk about session zero a lot, but not as much people talk about the next important thing arguably the most important part of the campaign, which is session one. Um, and why it, it seems like a lot of people who want to start campaigns who have not done so in the in the past, right? If they've never uh, run anything, seem to like burn up like a fireball and re-entry before session one even starts. And uh, I got myself to thinking or burn up and like I a came fireball up. after session starts. Like session two, they burn up. You know, is that do you think that's more common? Yeah, I think it's more common that people do one session and then just fucking have a heart attack and explode. Like, mm. I think that's pretty common because one session people can just sort of wing it, you know, rock out with the cock out, go ballistic. And then they realize that they're like, I can't I can't keep doing this. What do I do now? And then they tap. Mm. That's fair. Fair. I have no, um, I have no uh, data to necessarily back this up, but you know, my sources that I made it the fuck up. Yes, my sources I made. The fuck up. Yeah, so I figured um, I could give the world Isaiah's step by step guide for session one and how to prep for session one because I'm currently prepping for a new campaign that starts in uh, two weeks. So I'm actually using this myself, except I'm going a lot harder and still not really doing it 100% because I'm kind of an animal. Um, do as but, I say, not as I do. Exactly. And I'm an experienced dungeon master. I've got four years of experience. This is for anybody who doesn't really. Or, I mean, if you do and maybe you want to just try it, let me know how it works. Because I never actually tested this, but it seems to make sense for me. Um, it seems to make sense. But before we get into any of that, Josh, do the thing. Do the thing, Zuli. Julie, and, Julie. Yeah. Uh, the the thing the thing that I am doing is telling you to do, which is to, what the fuck? What? what? The thi- yep. Just hit follow. Just please hit follow or subscribe. Whatever the button says, you're looking at your screen. Whatever that button says, hit that button. <clears throat> the train went off. In the a tracks ring and a dang. There. Yeah, just uh, yeah, hit the button and ring it a dang dang the bell if you're catching us on YouTube. Um, I don't even yeah, think let's that, start that, from the top. You know the bell doesn't exist anymore, right? As a does it not? Hold on, the bell literally wait. does not exist. I, I don't. The bell has been molded into the subscribe button. Checking right the fuck now. I, you could check the bell Pause. is part of the subscribe button. Oh, yeah, yeah, but you can, like, still make it so that it's, like, all of the videos and whatnot. Yeah, that doesn't seem to do anything, I'm gonna be honest. Because I don't have all checked for anybody, and I still get all videos from everyone I'm subbed to, as far as I can tell. So I don't know that it's really doing much of anything. 
Well, the bell just sends you like a notification on your phone. Oh yeah, I fucking hate those. So yeah, no. Yeah. I think I've only ever done that for one YouTuber and it's fucking Scalagrim. <laughs> Fair enough. I, it's I, literally, I fucking hate push notifications. Fair enough. Scalagrim, if you are watching this, huge fan of your work, bud. I've been there since like 2013. You're awesome. Um, yeah. So I figured we start at the top of my notes. Uh, you don't want to go from the bottom gonna, up, just totally out of order. Yeah, sure. So we'll start. Um, this serves two purposes. Convention is broken. Truly a shame. Uh, it allows players to scratch that. Yeah, never mind. Um, you know, that, that was a disaster. We're just going to start from the top. <clears throat> Why do people find that session one, that is to say, starting a campaign, so difficult? Uh, now, from what I can gather from both first and second hand accounts, because I've had friends who've tried starting campaigns. I have tried starting a campaign and then I burnt up at session one. Um, I think the, the main issue that people run into and stop me if you've heard this one before, is that people get way too bogged down with the sheer amounting of the sheer amount of world building that they want to do but not enough short-term prep for what they need to do. And that sort of analysis paralysis makes people think that running the game is actually far more difficult than it really is, thus resulting in people going, I just can't do this. And then the campaign explodes on re-entry or on entry, I guess. Yeah, on entry. You didn't even get to the re-entry. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't even think... I think most people... You might be giving people almost too much credit here because I don't even think people get close enough to even consider session one. I think they burn up at like session negative one. Like, I think a lot of people burn up before they even tell people about the idea half the time. You know what I mean? Like, I think there's a lot of campaigns that die in the in the black abyss, the ether of the mind, because nobody even mentions like they'll have an they'll have an idea and not even bother to tell anyone because they're so stressed out about all the minutia of it that it doesn't even it doesn't it it's not even born it's not even a fetus it's not even a concept <laughs> in utero really yeah pretty much because yeah I, I don't know i'm not i don't even want to say it's specifically the world building it's just people when they're thinking about starting a campaign they think they need to have every single domino placed from point A to point Z before they start to do anything. Like every domino must be placed and then you hit start. When in actuality, you know, what you should do is place like three dominoes and then just keep putting them in front of the fucking thing before they fall. You know, you just build the train track in front of you is really what you should do because if you try to place every domino from A to Z, it's just, it's just not, po it, I mean, it's possible. I shouldn't say it's not possible. It's possible. It's not reasonable. And it's also not beneficial because if you try to just to figure out every little nuance of the kind of game and the world building and the kind of characters you want to have and the sorts of NPCs and all the homebrew you're going to do, you just, you're just uh, you're setting yourself up for failure as you basically pigeonhole yourself into only one specific brain brain what into only one brain. specific game that you have crafted in your brain that's not actually going to exist because the game you craft in your brain is never the game that you play because when you're crafting in your brain there's only one variable which is you and then when it hits the table there's five variables which is you and the four other players <laughs> So not only should you not do it because it's a lot of work, it's actively detrimental. Yeah. To, to you know, long story short, that one. Yeah. Um, now, I, this is not necessarily a call out. I'm guilty of this for sure. I'm doing it right now, prepping for the campaign because I've got a million characters and plot hooks and missions that I want the players to go through. But the sheer amount of it really scrambles my ADHD uh, and then I just end up getting that dog in me and then it stops me from peppering things. Um, that'll happen like in the immediate like session one or the session after that. And uh, yeah, it's a pain in the ass, but don't worry. I got you. Now, in the case that 
you aren't you like you've stopped yourself from the analysis paralysis you've stopped yourself from trying to build 18 million npcs for a campaign that will at this point not come to fruition what what do you absolutely need for session one players players yes <laughs> um now i mean beside players you need an objective right you need things to do uh and what i have prepared i call the three by three rule meaning that to have a good session one all you need are three npcs three environments and three ways to solve the the the, the problem in question now this doesn't mean solve the problem as in like a to z how to finish the quest but how to go about the main conflict of the quest in three different ways uh for the npcs what you need right you need the client uh the end what and i'm calling I'm, I'm giving them like code names really like really sort of anachronistic names that provide you a base idea of what they are there's a lot out of order i wrote so much that i didn't really think about how i was going to convey this message as you can tell um and each one will be done like this yeah so the first npc you will need i have dubbed the client uh the npc that provides them with the plot hook and like the initial plot hook for the adventure they're about to go on uh this person can technically also be the person they report back to which i will refer to later on which could bring the number down to two but for now let's just pretend that you're gonna have two different people right now I, this kind of is self-explanatory the players find themselves in the tavern the whatever the fuck wherever they are they need someone or something to actually in, uh, uh, include them within the world something to grab their attention or have their attention be grabbed that can point them in a direction that they need to go in right and the best way to do this because you can do like the quest board or whatever but having someone walk up and be like oh you are the brave adventurers i need something done and i will pay you in money yeah that's it's the easiest way to get them to do things like just put the gold in front of them they'll, they'll in just money start specifically yes as opposed to like i don't know like a handy j under the table yeah, I don't know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> handy handy j and a crisp high five yeah <laughs> after the fact too <laughs> yep that would unironically be the most savage thing on the planet <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness. Uh, after the client, you need the target, right? The bad guy, the boss, the fucking bag of hit points that you're going to whack in the next session or two. Whack. Um, whack. Uh, separate from the objective itself, the target is what is standing between the players and the actual objective. Could the name have been better than target? Yes, but I was really tired when I wrote this. Fuck you. Um, there is also the like absolute chance that whatever the target is, it doesn't speak. It could be like a giant rat or something that doesn't have any like communicable personality. Once again, yes. Congratulations. You've made the situation simpler for yourself, but let's just for the sake of generalizations, assume that they're also like a speaking, thinking NPC. No, I think. And it's then finally, if we assume it's just Lord of the Rats, Rat King. Mm. So does, do they only just be, say, do like the rats, rats? We are the rats. Yeah, they don't talk. We come just... at night. We sleep at night. <laughs> they just make rat noises. <laughs> That the GM has to make like yeah. perfectly. Yeah. It gets so fucking annoying after like five minutes. Uh, Maybe. The final NPC that you're going to need is called the recipient. Uh, it's whoever the fuck that you're going to bring the quest to that will actually be paying you. Um, and fun little little thing you can do is that character because there can therefore then give them more quests. So the recipient will become the new client. And then you can make another target, another recipient, and this cycle perpetuates. And you can just sort of extrapolate this across an entire campaign. A very low stakes, pretty minimalist campaign, I'm not going to lie, but you could do it that way yes. and totally work. Uh, I mean, I, I feel like the recipient is often the client, like the two are often one in the same. Um, But I don't, I mean, I don't... Uh, I do like the idea here, but I do think it's also worth pointing out. I think you could do a session one with absolutely zero NPCs other than the things you're, the characters are fighting. You could, yes, but I, I so like I said, you could make this system a lot simpler. I just was trying to generalize it into something uh, quantifiable 
that can give like NP it gives the, the GM a chance to sort of stretch their creative muscles by give by like learning how to come up with NPCs that are just fleshed out enough to serve a purpose and to feel like they're real characters and not just like every starting NPC in a, in a JRPG that just tells you one can dialogue and that's it. You could absolutely like throw this system out and not use it at all. But again, it's it's for people who are just like trying to be as generalist as possible. Yes, and true. Like I said, the, the, the recipient and the client can be one and the same fairly often. Um, in which case you've just made the job easier for yourself. Nice. Congrats. I, I think, yeah, I think they, I think most of the time people assume they're one in the same. Probably. But then I most. wouldn't have my neat three by three. That being said, if you're playing a cyberpunk game, they're probably not one in the same. Uh, True. You'll, yeah, you're going to have your fixer and whoever the fuck the fixer yeah, is yeah. sending you to deal with. Yeah. yeah. I suppose, yeah, I suppose it also depends on the genre in question. Well, the genre always changes things up, but th- these are broad enough that they definitely can apply to pretty much anything. Mm. Uh, after that, and feel free to comment. Like, what do you what do you think? Beside the fact that you might not need three, like, yes, work good. Yeah, I mean, if you're using it as like a template for somebody who's not sure how to do a session one, it definitely works as a template because. It's yeah, you can draw, you can slot in whatever characters you want. I personally don't like I, I don't want to say I don't worry about NPCs for session one, but NPCs are kind of on the back burner for session one for me, uh, give or take like uh, maybe some brief introduction things, but I kind of don't worry about NPCs very much on session one because my method is always to get the players directly into the action and get shit going on and usually the best way to do that is you know we don't have any time to talk we must kill the goblins now get to goblin killing who are you don't worry about it I'll tell you later you know that kind of thing yeah I don't have time to explain why I don't have time to explain kill the goblins I you played destiny one right I didn't but I know the meme yeah I (laughs) I, so I, I did some I, some interning back in high school at a hospital, and the guy there, who I still talk to, um, like would just he just he was the the fucking system admin for the whole hospital. And he just had a PS4 in his desk that he would like pop the thing open to so it could breathe, and would just start playing Destiny As on, you the, do. on the hospital Wi-Fi. As you do, because he's like, I'm the sys admin who's gonna snitch on me. <laughs> I savage. All right. and I remember very specifically, he was like, he was talking to, to one of our co-workers uh, who was like the hospital photographer. And he was like, how do you do? Like, he's like, I don't understand. How did you do that? And he's like, I don't have time to explain why I don't have time to explain. <laughs> and then he laughed and I saw his smile slowly fade away. And he was, eventually he was like, God, that line is so fucking stupid. This, this game story sucks. It's just <laughs> it's so fun to play. God, I hate it so much. It is a really dumb, <laughs> like, it is a dumb line. <laughs> Yeah, it was just so funny how he thought about it for a second. He was like, no, then he got sad. No, never mind. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, Destiny one. You were not great. And then you were solid for two whole expansions. And then you were not great again in the final one. Guys, did play it. I remember. Destiny one was great. I've, I've heard Destiny two is never played very one or mid. two. I feel like you'd really like it. I'm good. Why? It's like it's got like your 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 fun uh, kind of MMO because you got like raids and like high tier yeah. content. No, I know. I know what the game is. I just have no. I I just don't. Well, a I don't need another game in my life like that, and b I have a lot of frustrations with the way they handled their like narrative and world building stuff and all this other crap. Like I've just, I'm I've, I'm pretty familiar with the game and like yeah I'm good. I've been interested. Hmm. It's intrigued me from time to time, but it's another one of those things too, where I feel like I've missed the boat by such a lo- large margin at this point that I'm like, eh, fuck it. It's fine. That is a hundred percent me with fucking my hero academia. <laughs> I'm sure it's good. I just, I just can't, I couldn't give a fuck if you bade me. Uh, I mean, at this point, a lot of people say it's not good anymore, but that's not the hero. <laughs> I've also heard that. yet. You'd absolutely be a warlock player. <laughs> 
I, of course I'd be a warlock player. I knew before I even played the game what class I would play. Ah, oh, perfect. For Wasn't perfect. even a question. As soon as I saw them, I was like, ah, oh, yes, warlock, of course. I get to oh, hell yeah. fly around in space lightning. Of course, that's what I'm going to play. Fly around space lightning, cool fucking bloodborne hunter coats. Yeah. Teleport jumping. Let's fucking go. Yeah. Warlock was my class. I had so much fun. And not surprised at all. Yeah, no, I was a dirty meta player, though. So I had the gloves that gave me the, the fucking homing grenades. And I got, like, the best, like, homing for the homing grenades. So I could throw it and completely whiff, and it would just magnet onto you and one-shot you. I was a dick in that game. <laughs> nice. Not as bad as anyone played Mita. Anyway. Fuck you if you use the Mita multi-tool. Um... <clears throat> After after you've got your three NPCs made, you need them to to sort of act and react within space, right? So you need your three environments. And what what are those environments, you might ask, dear listener? I'm gonna fucking tell you. So your first environment fist. that you're gonna need to prep. The monkey monkeys. Yeah, the monkey chain. The monkey <laughs> fist. The, the monkey, monkey. <laughs> Those are your three environments. I think the thing that made that the best was fucking King Kong. What? Oh. The video I said yeah. where this is King Kong. Yeah. Yes. The first uh, first environment you will need uh, is what I call the tavern, for obvious reasons. Um, the environment does not have to literally be a tavern, but it is essentially the meeting place where players can make introductions, have time to test the waters of, like, the setting and some of the like more fiction forward aspects of the game gather information necessary to give them that that uh, uh, that good old uh, agency that they need to make decisions going forward. That sweet, sweet agency that can never be taken away ever, even if it makes sense for the narrative. Um, don't worry about it. Uh, why is this important? Well, it kind of isn't like this is the weird thing. And I know that I put it in here to be like, no, it's important. You should put it in. It's it's the least important of the three environments because they can technically the players could pop up in the forest or the whatever. But I think a lot of really uh, uh, I hate to use the phrase generic, but a lot of games, especially when they're starting with new GMs, they have this like desire to have the players sort of pull a critical role and just immediately get into the role play and, and do whatever. But not all parties are like that, right? If you start them off in the forest, which I will explain in a second, they might not really know what to do or how to proceed if they've not thought about, you know, how their character does things, um, what aspects of the fiction they're going to follow. Uh, maybe they haven't read through their character sheets completely. The tavern gives them a good spot, like a buffer, basically, between the initial jump of the campaign to actually getting into the meat and potatoes of it all. And for that reason, I have put it here. I mean, uh, up I'll, next, I, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest. Uh, your players are not going to do the critical role thing on session one. Like ever. It's just not going to happen unless it's a group that you've played with a bunch with already multiple times and are all comfortable playing around each other that's the only way you're gonna get that if it's like a fresh group or over or half the group is new people or people that aren't don't usually play together you are not gonna get the critical role thing in session one no matter what do not try and force that it's just not gonna happen it's okay no correct it's it's not gonna happen and then you're just gonna feel kind of bad about yourself because you're like how come how come i couldn't get them to do the thing you're just not gonna like, just don't give yourself that expectation. Expect that your first session is going to be a little awkward as, as like players and characters find their footing uh, and start to really get a hold of what's their, you know, what the game is going to be like. Don't set, don't set yourself up for failure. Yes, do not do that. Or don't if, set like, your expectations up for failure. I did something like that. Don't set your expectations too high. Basically. Granted, uh, personally, I, uh, the tavern bit, I, I'm not a fan. I've talked about that before, but it has its uses. True. And you are, again, you know, 
you're quite experienced when it comes to GMing, so I think you very easily can skip this step entirely and be perfectly fine. Like, shit. Fucking beyond the gods, we were fine. Like, I mean, I, I would argue that everyone can actually skip this step and get more success out of it than they realize, but people are hesitant to do so, and I think the main reason people are hesitant to do so is because newer GMs, one of the main problems they have is that comfortableness uh they lack the confidence in their authority and when i say authority i sort of mean their ability to control the the pace of things uh they lack the confidence in their authority to just move things along so they give the players all this time to faff about and all this room to do whatever because they think that that will make the players happy because they don't want to be pushy and annoying or like too authoritative but you actually should be because if you just push the players along that gives the players something to react to because you say this happens they say i do this you say this happens they say i do this like giving them something to immediately react to often is just better so i think the tavern thing people lean on it but i don't actually think people need to lean on it quite the way they think they do that being said you could sort of replace the tavern and just say a general first meetup area is kind of really what we're talking about here. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, the tavern does not have to be a literal tavern. It's just wherever the tutorial area it's is. It's a place where, yeah, the idea is the player characters meet up and then you give them some basic information and then you get going. I think the problem, I think the, the fuck up that a lot of people have is the getting going. They like take too long to get to that point like they take forever to just get things rolling and that's the part that the gm should really focus on like you as a gm should be like okay we are going now stuff is happening now doing the thing like because otherwise your players will just faff about with their thumb up their ass Mm -hmm. now once the players have gotten their initial plot hook right they're they're ready to get going as it were the next area that you should pre- you should prep realistically, I call the forest. Once again, not a literal forest, but it is uh, it's the locale that the players will need to travel through or to, where they might encounter their first combat. Uh, the zone acts like a more of a a mechanical tutorial for the players, often introducing them to the combat for the first time, and the combat is likely going to be low stakes. You know, like rats or some goblins or something something to familiarize themselves with the combat style of the game and how the more crunchy side of uh the mechanics might get going uh if the if uh if your campaign uses battle maps this would be the first place to have one yep i mean that's all i'm gonna get just yeah (laughs) I, um, I worked so hard for this, Josh. I'm sorry. I was I was thinking. Um, yeah, I mean, the forest. Yeah, the idea of traveling from point A to point B. This is your sort of in between stretch. Uh, this is where I think the thing. Yeah, you could get the first combat tutorial. You can also get in. This is where you'll get the first sort of um, messing around with the general mechanics sort of stuff like for example if it's D, this is where you can get some skill checks in there you know if it's a cyberpunk game maybe this is where you're gonna do some like stake in the stake in the mission area out type stuff you know uh stuff along those lines playing with this sort of interacting with the general non-combat focused mechanics this is also where you will hit that uh, and well, it doesn't have to be a forest. It's often great when it is a forest. Big fan of spooky forest. Yeah, look, it's, it's a classic freezing. Uh, as it. you'll notice, all of the, the, the fucking names I've used are pretty like they're cliches, but they're damn good ones. And cliches are cliches for a reason. Listen, I don't love the tavern, but I love me the spooky forest. Yeah, yeah of course. I think it's because there is just infinite possibilities for a spooky forest. Like, and yeah, pretty, pretty much, much all of it makes sense. Yeah. Everything from, like, a Wendigo to some bandits to some, like, kobolds that lock themselves out of their own lair and, like, set a bunch of traps. And now they're like, help. Help, we're stuck out of here. What do we do? <laughs> Please help us get into our dungeon. 
uh, yeah, like I said, uh, like what, blah, 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 fuck me. Like what me and Josh said, it, it allows players to really interact with the, the crunchier side of the game in a very introductory way that won't, you know, drown them in, what's, what's a really dumb one? Like grappling rules in Shadowrun, what is that, like four pages? Um, no. Uh, Pathfinder has really long grappling rules. You might be thinking of that one. That's what, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, don't, yeah, you don't necessarily want to get into any of the more uh, crunchy, obnoxious mechanics. That's for, I mean, I'm trying to think what would be the 5e equivalent. Like, don't do, uh, I don't know, don't use crafting rules right away. Like, that's not even a good, I'm trying to think of what a good, like comparison what in 5e would be uh like jump distances and climbing rules yeah yeah that's not about basically don't 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 start with any of the mechanics that require like rules minutia stuff start with your basic skill check dc yes or no pass or fail type shit yeah they've got they've got to hop over a puddle before you can strap rockets to the orc and make it scale in the mountains because you don't want to do the combat encounter Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that being said, combat encounters are a minutia thing, but they're they're you know you kind of can't skip that. You have to do it at some point. They're, so yeah, they're a minutia thing, but they're also a major factor of the game, especially um, if you're playing something like D and D. The focus of the game. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, after the forest, you get to you get to Sons of the Forest. Hmm. Yes. True. But what you actually get to is what I like to call the layer. Uh, the layer is what is classified as the final confrontation area of the session. The reason why I'm calling it the layer and not the place where you fight the bad guy or the stage or whatever is because it should exist as more than just that uh, a stage for you to kill some bandits and make no mistake. Killing the bandits will happen here, but this is an area that will allow the players to flex their own creative muscles and think about uh, outside of the box solutions to whatever problem you present them. Um, but also saying try the layer has a good ring to it. It does, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it allows you to let them confront the situation from several angles by doing things like scouting, infiltrating, stealing, oh, setting up ambushes. Angles. Mm, will you? Right yep. here? Right here on podcast while we're recording? Yep. From 15 states away? Yep. Mm. Yep. Nice. I just thought of the, hey, nice cock. <laughs> <laughs> nice cock. Uh, this, session, this part of the uh, of the creative process, I'm not going to lie. It, it is the most prep heavy by far. But don't worry, we'll explore that in the next part. Uh, it can be, but it can also kind of be the most fun part. True, true. Like, just because something is a lot of work doesn't mean that it's not enjoyable work. Like, in fact, often personally, the other way around, it's often. Yeah. If I, there's more work involved, it's often the payout is better. Yeah. Like, this is what uh, this is one part that I like to do thinking about the tactical side of things. Like, don't get me wrong. I really like making NPCs uh, and like planning out stories and stuff, but like actually figuring out the minutia of the heist or you know, the, the breaking and entering or the door kicking, whatever you want to call it. That's the fun part, because then you can set up all these little puzzle pieces and see how the players either interact with or blow those pieces the fuck up. I'm usually a ladder player, as you can ask, Josh. It's true. A lot of blowing things up. Yeah. Very true. Now, you, you might go, but like... How do I do that, though? Like, what What? What do you mean? Like, how do I prepare this area? What do just, I do? Just do it, well, forehead. Well, that too. Yeah, just do it, forehead. Just fucking <laughs> just rock it all out. What's the worst that's going to happen? The players die. If they die, they die. It be that way sometimes. And then you go, oh, the players died in session one. Crazy. It was all a dream. It was all a dream or or the actual Chad move. Not going to lie would be if you pulled the fucking Matt Colville, you know, the this is the scripted lost section. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That works, too. And then be like, roll new fucking characters, dweebs. <laughs> well, 
Well, he didn't. I would never play at your table again, but I would appreciate how hard you went. <laughs> I mean, he didn't make them roll new characters, but it was. No, he didn't. He, he chose section. one character, like yes. two scripted die in the session. Yeah. Well, that was actually later, but also the character who scripted died was the player's idea, kind of. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Yes. No. I thought that was something like worked out together. They did. They worked it out together, but like the initial idea was kind of on the player. Oh, OK, OK, OK. Um, now, when you're preparing the layer, like I said, you want to prep in, in just, you know, to keep the rule going three solutions to any given problem. Now, some of you might be saying, but I say I've heard that you should never plan out how to solve the problem, because then when the players don't do what you planned out, then you get confused and flustered. You're not wrong. You're not. You're not wrong. But I think it requires a shift in perspective to know why I'm doing this. You want to build these solutions, not because you want to codify how the players can solve a problem. What you're actually doing is setting up three layers of mix and match that you can use as as sort of concrete touchstones that you can bridge across when the players eventually deviate from the plans that you've set, right? Uh, well, I, I would say more than anything, what you're doing is setting up possible ID, possible, possible, possible. What the hell was I just about to say? You're setting up ways that the players could possibly solve the problem. But those ways are sort of broad and general ideas that you have. Like you're thinking from the DM side, if I was a player, this is how I would try to solve the problem. And then you're setting those up as a GM, but you're leaving them open enough that the players could tackle them from, you know, basically an infinite number of potential ways. And then once the players start to tackle the issue, you kind of funnel, you kind of funnel your thinking towards one of those potential solutions that you thought of. But the idea, exactly. The, 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 the main thing is keep them really broad and open so that they have room to be futzed with as the players start to enter the equation. Exactly. Um, for the sake of this, I, I don't have any actual hard and fast uh, nicknames for these, but for the sake of I've, I've prepared a little a, a, a little hypothetical for example for you. Yeah, a little hypothetical for you. Uh, I'm going to be dubbing these the high road, middle road and low road for each one. Let's say that the lair is a bandit camp that's located in like an old dilapidated fort, right? You as the DM think of a couple simple solutions for how the players can get whatever the treasure is, the MacGuffin, really, and you come up with these three. Sneak in, steal the treasure, try to kill as few of them as possible. The high road. You can go in guns blazing, kill the bandits, reclaim the treasure, return it to the recipient. The middle road. Or try to sneak in, like the first example, but your whole intent is to kill literally everyone and leave no one alive, except for the bandit and his like elite posse who you will have to fight in a final boss fight. The low road. Now, understand uh, that these solutions are nowhere near perfect, and they don't need to be because your players will come up with basically infinite solutions that will more often than not rarely, if ever, go to plan for any of these. But like we said, the whole point is to give you these little touchstones that you can go, okay, they're going to sneak in. All right, that's one. Uh, they're going to try to fight people when they can, but leave it to like small skirmishes. Okay. And they're going to try to steal the treasure without killing the bad guy. Okay. Right. You can take those three pieces and understand that you've thought about little little snippets of of description or maybe some cause and effect uh, skill checks for each of these things and leave them broad enough so that you can tie them together or cut the cord if they immediately shift into a new lane. Uh, yeah. I mean, that pretty much lines up with what I was saying about keeping them broad. Yeah. Hey everybody, uh, we are back. Uh, you probably didn't notice anything. Um, it's fine. Where was I? 
that's right. Uh, at discussing your mom's the, house. the that's not true. I'm at my dad's house. My mom no, no, doesn't you're have at, a house you're anymore. At their mom's house. Oh, true. In the walls. She listens to this. I, I'm definitely going to get a call about that. <laughs> <laughs> Probably shouldn't have said that in hindsight. Oh my god, why did I say that? Oh my god. <laughs> you know, there's still time on the editing room floor. No, no, Brett, don't you dare edit that out. <laughs> Because that was too funny to fucking edit out. I'm just going to take the L where it lies. Jesus Christ. Life. Back on, get, get back on topic, sir. Jesus Lord. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, what we discussed previously was the, the, the use of the high, middle, and low road sort of template pieces that will allow you as the DM to sort of follow the narrative as the players unravel it and or flub every check they're trying to make to not, you know, scramble it to pieces. You can use those pieces, the ones that they have not flubbed <laughs> or the, the pieces that you are using, the templates, if you will. I'm fucking this up so bad. Um, Just going to let this out. Yeah, no, it's fine. You can use the templates you've set up to create through lines that will allow you to help guide the players through the journey that would be low level play. <laughs> uh, and you might be like, but how much do I improv? Like, that's a lot. Like, what do I do? How Poor why? For why, DM? Why can't I just plan this all out? Because it's just not how the game works, bud. Sorry. I don't know. I'm gonna have to tell you if, if if I'm breaking this news to you, that sucks, my man. I, I don't even know what to tell you about that. But no plans to have the contacts game. with players. Yes, yes, literally that. <laughs> you know the saying is no plan ever survives first contact with the enemy. The plan never survives any contact with the players. They are the, the only thing. They are yeah. The only thing you could ever guarantee is that if you plan something out, your players will pick up on about thirty percent of it. Go, I know what the answer is and then draw and then work incredibly off of, wrong conclusions. Yeah, incredibly wrong conclusions. And then you either have to try to reel them back in, which never works. Like you've let the bulls out of the cage at this point. They're going to parade and you're just going to have to live with that. Uh, Brett, do the fucking bulls on parade guitar riff, please. <laughs> it was... uh, God damn it! Every time I do a stupid segue, I forget what I'm talking about. Uh huh. Uh huh. No. Yeah. The essence of the game <laughs> is that it's really inherently uh, it's ethereal, right? It's improvisationable by nature because the players are going to say and do things that you never really expected, and that's fine, right? And that no reasonable fact, human should say or do, and yet here we are. And yet here we are. Yeah. Uh, you, you have to think about it this way, right? The players are, are doing improv at literally every turn, right? They don't have the script. They don't know how, unless they've read the module or whatever, they don't know what's going to happen next. So they're just bouncing ideas off of you. And at some point you're going to run out of script. So you have to learn how to bounce the ideas back off of them, right? It's just how it's going to happen. Uh, in these situations, that prep work you did, that's what this is for. They're going to be your anchor points. Now, let's continue on with the with with the for instance that I gave the hypothetical of the old dilapidated fort. Let's say one of your players is a rogue and they want to sneak through a hole in the wall made by like a trebuchet forever ago. The rogue will go about their business, you know, infiltrating the base, taking note of the bandits and their locations. But you know, let's just say your rogue does the thing that every fucking rogue does and they're struck by a spot of whimsy. Let's say they get they gain access to the like bandit captain's personal quarters where the MacGuffin is. And so they could they, you know, they want to steal back said MacGuffin, but they go. I wonder what else you got lying around here? And you, Dungeon Master, and your panic induced day before prep, forgot to think about whatever the fuck what else would be lying around. But don't worry. This is where the improv comes in. Right? You're the GM. In this situation, you know 
that the bandits are basically just like highwaymen, like, you know, they're they're highwaymen. They're basically just robbers, ba- pretty much destitute, very little coin to their names. So the you camp also intended is filled with dildo. Damn, I want to go to that camp. That's awesome. <laughs> Can you imagine loading one into like a crossbow for like non-lethal damage? Ow. It would definitely hurt. Like that person, you, it, it, it was out. Like, it's a, uh, what's it called? It's not non-lethal. It's less than lethal. Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. It would be a less than lethal option. <laughs> yeah. Unless you caught some like right in the open mouth, though that would be amazing. <laughs> I don't know that it would fly very far though. No. No, you got, you've got maybe 20 feet on that fucker, and that's being generous. But yeah, l- let's say that, you know, you as the DM also know that you were going to give the bandit captain this, like, wax poetic speech about how unfair life is, and, you know, he's he's just going to be a wannabe fucking university philosopher to your party who, you know, probably doesn't care. But that's fine. That's fine. Don't worry about it. We're going to stick to the other point. You can add in, right? Like, give them some money, right? Like, they're they're gonna try to look for money. Give them money. And we're, you know what? To keep the like rule of thirds thing, we'll say they find some gold. You give them gold equal to like a third of what they find. So let's say the the whatever the MacGuffin is worth a hundred gold pieces. Toss them thirty. That'll tide everybody over. Let's say you've got they've each of them have five to ten pieces of gold in their pocket, depending on how many players you have. They're gonna be happy there, but you can keep going. Let's say they also find uh, journals written by the bandit captain, maybe some plans for future heists. Hell, throw in like material goods, like paintings and jewelry, like stuff that could add up theoretically to the aforementioned third of the total money. But it's something that the players might want to keep for flavor purposes, right? Give you a perfect example. When we fought the bandit captain, maybe this is where I thought of this. I'm not going to lie. In Avernus, right? Uh, uh, Whatever the fuck that guy's name is. Bandit. He has like a. Yeah. He's just got like a, a like a, a pearl ring that for like what three sessions we were like this thing probably magic and then Sam eventually was like it's not magic and I went I'm sad now but my character is going to keep the ring anyway because I want my character to have a ring I was like, more thinking of when the, your character kept the skull that too yeah yeah we it we was fought like a, a fucking sugar skull or some shit. Or yeah, we fought a a acolyte of Ball yeah, who like yeah, that's had a skull for a head, so we killed him. And my character took his skull no, and no, painted no, no. it up like it a wasn't sugar his skull. head. He had like stuff, and one of the things in the pile of stuff in the like chest was the skull. Oh, was that it? Yeah, wasn't his yeah, head. I we think didn't that was decapitate it. Decapitated, yeah. take his head. Jesus Christ! I mean, would you put that past pause? I mean, no, but goddamn. <laughs> Either way, my character took the skull and painted it up like a Dia de los Muertos skull. Yeah. Um, and put the crown that we also got on the skull uh, with like the treasure on top of the sugar skull and kept it as a coffee table ornament with his Christmas cactus he cared a lot for. Shout out to that Christmas cactus. Do the real one. <laughs> Don't know why it's. Uh, Point now, being, give your players little trinkets. Yes, give them trinkets, and this serves because they'll two get excited about it. They will. It's memorabilia. The that they'll c- remember, like you know, getting a couple gold. You're like, eh, whatever. Finding the ornate painting of the beautiful acolyte woman is like, you know, it's a more memorable thing. Yeah. Shit, right? I don't remember how much money we made when we did that dungeon, but we all remember that fucking skull. <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. We definitely don't remember the money we got. Uh, what else do you remember? We remember the, the fucking random paintings we got when we killed the dragon. We were like, these are going to look so good in the Itzaria. Yep. We are going to have so many Michelin stars. No, that was, I know the, it only no, that was, three. That was the rugs. The rugs. That's right. That's right. Yeah, and yeah. then the giant, the giant animal skull that Ant's character just took. Just took. Yeah. They just I, strapped to his back. And I don't think was ever sold. No, no. I think that skull went with us into oblivion. Yeah, it was just kind of around. I like the idea that he just like adorned it like extra armor on his like portal <laughs> shell. Yeah, he, he did the fucking uh, Garrosh Hell Scream and got bone shoulder pads. Yeah. Oh, now I'm just thinking about Vecna's like weird axe shoulder pad things in the new art. 
then I thought about his stupid cowl crown. His goofy crown, yeah. I... He... You uh, fucked with perfection. I don't know why they did it. He was perfect. I don't know. Like, hashtag Mad Max. Perfect. Perfect in every way. <laughs> I don't know. But they were like, what if we made him look more regal? Wait, Mad Max? What? Yeah, the whole thing where where the guy, where Rictus is like, I have a baby brother. I have a little baby brother. And he was perfect. I like perfect how you everywhere. didn't reference the meme, which is Homelander saying that. <laughs> oh, the, it was perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Down to the tiniest, minute details. Yeah. I, I don't know. I like Mad Max more. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> sure. But like the meme that everyone uses is Homelander. <laughs> I know. I don't know. We fuck. We also watched Mad Max like two days ago. I know. I I get it. I just I just did. When you made the perfect joke, I thought of the Homelander meme. I did not think of Rictus and Mad Max. That was not where my brain went. I, then maybe maybe you should think about Rictus or Rectus more. I you know maybe. Did you laugh upon <laughs> hearing his full name? <laughs> maybe I miss. I did forget that was his full name. Anyway. Is he always coming back for Furiosa? What? How? What? Oh, well, yeah. Because it's prequel. a prequel? Prequel, yeah. right, right. I right, think right, we're right. getting Nux back, too. My boy. Probably. Still, because it's a prequel, he's still going to have absolute no bitches. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> but it will be cool to see him again. Does he have the cancer, though? His mates. Larry and Barry? Probably. Yeah. He probably, probably does, yeah. Unless probably. that manifests later on in life, in which case, oof. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Anyway. Uh, where were we? <laughs> we're close to the end, actually. Pretty Loot. short episode today. Loot. Yeah. Giving them, like, trinkets and memorabilia serves two purposes, really. Um, and I know, yes, the convention is broken. Why not three purposes? I don't know. I couldn't think of a third one. Fuck off. I mean, it it's not like a hard and fast rule. It's a convention you made for yourself, so I think it's okay. True. True, true. It allows players to scratch that itch, right? Like they feel like they've accomplished something by finding the cool loot. Uh, and it also gives you ammunition that you can call upon later to create new plot hooks, right? That journal full of the, the bandits, like, you know, musings about how unfair life is that also have the future heists. Maybe that leads to a larger bandit syndicate that are like planning heists all over the kingdom or Maybe it's like a Treasure Island thing. The the journal's final entry is about this like super hidden magic tomb thing that definitely doesn't have a super evil lich in it named a Sararak that is trying to screw everything over. Oh, this see, could lead into tomb annihilation. You said I just thought of that. A tomb of annihilation. True. Yeah. Uh, you, you said Atlantis, and I just thought about them finding the big underwater scorpion automaton monster. Dude, the Leviathan. That is my favorite iteration of the Leviathan. It just is a big cool fucking one. lobster. Yeah, it's just a big lobster. Yeah, I said scorpion. Yeah, it's just a big lobster. Big mecha like lobster. Fucking Vinny. What did Vinny say? He's like, uh, I think it was yeah. You know, well, yeah, guys, like with this, I think white wine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, my favorite. Why is Vinny just the best character? In Literally the best character. Yeah, my favorite is still a paper clips. Big ones. <laughs> big ones. <laughs> <laughs> it's the pause. It's the pause on the big ones. Yeah. Hey, look, I made a bridge and it took me 12 ten, seconds. Yeah, it's 12. 13. 10 tops. seconds. <laughs> and 12 seconds tops. I like that he's like a Sicilian dude from fucking Brooklyn. <laughs> he's, just, <laughs> yeah. he's just every Sicilian, like 30 something from the 70s, from like the 60s. Yeah. Oh, it's probably earlier than that, no, because it was like post World War Two. Fuck. Uh, 50, 60, something like that. Anyway, yeah. The the little things that you add, all of this to sum to summarize, those little things that you add, oh, uh, they give you. I called it ammunition, but those are just future stories waiting to happen that you can call on and you can repeat this entire equation down the line. Uh, Plus one bridge, like one thing to create a two, two to four, four to six, and then you have a whole campaign. Uh, we were both hilariously long wrong. Uh, it takes place in 1914. Ooh. Yep. Wow. We were way off. Anyway. Oops. Whoopsies. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Thoughts, Josh? On which part? 
like you can use the things that you set up these like seemingly meaningless things to the players oh yeah i mean if you on. yeah that kind of goes into the not not feeling like you have to set up every possible domino because if you don't set up every possible domino and then your players go around like you weren't expecting the players to be interested enough in the bandit camp to actually loot it very thoroughly so you didn't plan very much but then the players decide they want to loot the bandit camp so you throw some stuff in there yada 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 and then they find this bandit journal from the uh, you know the bandit captain that talks about this ancient temple or or ancient ruins you know somewhere out in the jungle that has like the key to fucking ultimate power so the bandits could become almighty and rich and that all the different arms of the bandit syndicate have been looking for these ruins blah 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 you could just throw that in there improv on a whim and now you're like okay that's campaign idea or at the very least adventure plan you know if not the full campaign that can be a good you know the first major arc of the campaign and by Mm -hmm. you know that only works I shouldn't say that only works that works best if you don't have every single domino set up because it gives you plenty of room to just build off ideas because you don't have anything for the future set up in the future so that's kind of that's what I was talking about where it's actually it seems like it might be a good idea like you know before session one hits the road to have every little thing set up but it is often actually detrimental so yes throw in little things Throwing little tchotchkes. You never know which one of those little tchotchkes are going to turn into a whole fucking plot hook or an entire little arc or even could just turn into like a really funny character moment that doesn't necessarily matter that much, but gets the players comfortable as their characters with each other. And then that eases you in for the next session. And now everybody's like a little more in the zone. Especially if we're talking True. about a group that hasn't played together a lot, which I think is sort of what we're assuming here. True, true. Actually, it does provide you like a third, a third purpose, right? So I was right at the end. I am the best. <laughs> <laughs> so smart. To a much, much, yeah, to a much lesser degree, it just helps fill things out. Yes. I think that's like a, an often overlooked thing for GMs is making the world that you're building feel like something that characters could live in or you know it's not just a script you read right yeah it, it in this feels, case it's literally not a script reading it feels like uh it feels like there's a thoroughness by way even though you're actually not being very thorough it feels like that there's a thoroughness by way of throwing little bits and bobs here that are clearly not super important but you know you do unimportant things throughout your day all the goddamn time you know you fucking go outside to let you know let your dog take a piss in the morning and then you're picking daisies up out of the fucking lawn for literally no goddamn reason because it's just like ooh funny fluffy flower like you know it's just <laughs> life just be like that so you doing it in game makes things feel more legitimate or just mentioning things like randomly offhand that don't really matter or whatever um i'm trying to think oh a, a great example is uh, just my players in the three-year campaign that, I, you know, the campaign I just finished, they just went to a melon, like a fruit stand shop, like a grocery store, just just to do some little just to do some little bits about melons. And then we decided that Anne's character was re- just really loved melons for no particular reason. And that's just like a thing, you know, just establishes that like, oh, yeah, grocery stores, those probably would exist or like fruit stands, you know, just a bit. Just a that thing. one's. Yeah, that one's also funny because that that actually became like a dramatic thing for his character. Like when the city was being attacked, he was like, fuck, I have to go see if the melon stand is OK. <laughs> yes, true. true. And like it wasn't actually like it was played as a joke. But to his character, it was like, no, I actually like that guy. Hold on. Is he OK? <laughs> yeah. How's the melon guy doing? It's kind of like the um, cabbage. It's like the cabbage guy in Avatar. Yes. Yeah. You know, like, is he relevant? No, but like he's always there. He just he just makes it feel like there's other stuff going on. I think for me that was that was finding and raising Tanya, <laughs> the fucking the cat, random yeah. trash cat that we found. Yep. I was literally I was fully expecting the cat. The, the, the thing with the cat was literally just to fuck with you guys. I did not expect you to like do anything with the cat. I expected the cat to just leave. But that didn't happen. 
jokes on you, me and Sam love cats. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's it's true. And I did know that. I don't know why I didn't assume that, to be honest. And the, the rules are simple. You put cat in front of me in game and it doesn't run away. I adopt it. <laughs> this is I don't make cat. the rules. I just work. I just work here. <laughs> Fair enough. Despite the fact that I, I literally did make the rule just now, regardless, hey, regardless. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't know. Irregardless. Yeah. My brain's. I believe it is irregardless. It's not. Not. Nope. Is it? Regardless. Irregardless is a double negative. Oh, that's true. It means not. That would mean not regardless. So you'd be going back to reg. No. Yeah. Irregardless is not a word. Anyway. My it's brain is like fucking mush today. Like I. <laughs> Why am I like this? I don't know. Y'all, ADHD is a hell of a drug. I like. <laughs> or lack thereof. Yeah, or lack thereof. Yeah. God. All right. Well, that's pretty much all I had. Uh, I was here to do my TED talk, and I've done that. And uh, wait, I did. Yeah. Did you? Did I, Wait, I thought you had another. No, another we talked bit? about the three solutions. Hold three on. baps, three peeps. Three peeps. Three peep. You know, the little marshmallow They're peoples, birds. Not, not the weird little marshmallow things. Yeah. yeah. God, I hate this. So oh, I love those things. <laughs> Did you watch Malcolm in the Middle as a kid? No. There's like a whole bit where the, where Malcolm's oldest brother who got sent to the military okay. was like, I could eat a hundred peeps in one sitting. That, when I was younger, made me literally like writhe in disgust. Yeah, I mean, that sounds unfair. I don't know that I would do that. Not a fan. Like, actually, to specify, I don't have anything wrong. I don't dislike peeps necessarily. I just can't eat marshmallows. So like, the idea of eating a hundred marshmallows in one sitting just makes you like <laughs> that sound specifically. That sound exactly. Yeah. In that exact cadence. Yeah. Okay. Octave and everything. Okay. Make sure. It, anything? Uh, any other bits you want to throw on at the end? No, I don't think so. I think that was it. I think I I I, I wrote this like a speech, and I've given the speech. <laughs> With Fair enough. no real room for any like in between discussion, and that was sort of stupid on my part, but I kind of hit a fugue state. It hit a fugue state. Yeah, I mean, if if I will uh, to add in on the end here, because I think the thing, I think one of the things that is the most useful tool ever, and I've said this multiple times, uh, but you know, since it's the topic in question, the most useful thing. Or a session one to me is always to just start your session one in media res and just get right into things like don't spend a lot of time uh, don't spend a lot of I don't I mean I don't know what other use word to use then don't spend a lot of time faffing about yeah because, don't meander too much yeah because the meandering you know that's the this is my thing about the starting in the tavern that is often problematic is that the game meanders around and and f often feels like what the nobody knows what the hell they're supposed to be doing and everyone's confused when you do the tavern start because the players are sitting around with or let me rephrase think about it this way right most of the time the way the tavern thing goes is the, you you as the gm are like all right players you're in a tavern. There's a hot waitress lady nearby. Drinks are being served. There's the noise of shouting of patrons. The bartender's a gruff, portly man with a big beard who yells some uh, curse words at you. What do y'all do? And the thing is, like, you've given the players nothing to latch onto. They have no objective. Their characters don't know each other yet. The players might not know each other if you're playing with, like, a totally fresh group. You know, there's nothing there to glom onto, so you're just expecting these four random people to just like come up with interesting shit on the spot, just do stuff with no guidance of any kind. And that's why I, the Ted like start in the tavern thing often annoys me. If you want to do the start in the tavern thing, but add a little bit more of an objective to it, you know, 
tell the players, you're all in a tavern, you're all hanging out, you're looking for XK, you're looking for Strider, right? Like, you're looking for this guy, Strider, he's gonna be in, like, a cool green cloak, and he's gonna be hanging around somewhere in this tavern. That is your objective, that's why you're currently in this tavern. Now you've at least given the players something to do, and they can do it kind of at whatever pace they want to do it, because, you know, looking for a guy in a in a bar is not, like, there's no time-sensitive thing there. But for me, personally, it's always about the in-media res, which... If you don't know, in media res just means you're starting the scene in the middle of the action. The action has already gotten going. Uh, The really classic in media res example that a lot of people know of from the movie world is Star Wars. Star Wars Episode 4, you immediately start and the rebel cruiser is fleeing from the Imperial Star Destroyer. The Imperials then board the cruiser. People are dying. Guns are being fired off. Darth Vader shows up looking all cool and shit. You know, it's in media res. The action's already started. We don't know anything. Keep in mind, obviously, these days, it's hard to imagine this. But if you imagine when Star Wars first came out, nobody knows any of the things that are going on on screen. Nobody knows what the fuck a stormtrooper is. You don't know what the hell the rebels are. You don't know who the fuck Darth Vader is. He's just this cool dude in a black cloak with a fucking spooky helmet. You have no idea who Princess Leia is. All you know is she's running away from these people for some reason. You have no context for any of this shit, but you're immediately interested because A, you have six billion questions like, who are these guys? Who are those guys? What are they doing? What's going on? And B, there's something happening right away. So you're immediately interested because there's action. Stuff's going on. Imagine, if you will, a movie that starts. And, you know, there's probably some movies out there that start like this, but I don't think most, you know, do. There's I'm sure there's some exceptions some fucking Martin Scorsese movie that's 35 hours long or some bullshit. But imagine if a movie starts and the main characters are all just sitting in a pizza joint in New York City talking about their taxes You know, like, you're going to be like, I don't know who these dudes are. I don't understand why I care about their taxes. Why are they in a pizza joint talking about this? What what is going on? You know, you have nothing to get invested or interested in. There's nothing really going on. You want to avoid that with your D&D game because your players want to have something to do. So by doing the in-media res, by starting right in the action players immediately have something to do and don't worry about the like oh but i want the players to like talk to each other and get to know each other's characters they will do that naturally in time you don't need to like you don't need to force that or give this this spot for that it will happen slowly over time you just let it be natural but if you give the players action then they're immediately going to start doing stuff and interacting with the game and trying to figure out, and they'll have moments in between all that because, you know, when action's going on, you can react to the action and you can, you know, it's hard if you haven't, if you're playing a new campaign, you have a new character, you don't have a strong idea of your character in session one. So you might not even really know how your character would react to X, Y, or Z thing. But if there's stuff going on, you have time to think about that. Be like, oh, we just fought a bunch of bandits. Well, my character's a hard and badass, so he's going to give some cool line about how he fucking loves killing bandits or whatever. You know, whatever horse shit you want to say. Or your character's a paladin, so he's going to argue with how we shouldn't have killed those bandits for, fi- for the next five minutes because he just won't shut up about his fucking oath or whatever. Shit like that. The in-media res tool is like... I don't know. It, I've I've always done it, and it just it's basically never failed me. There are, I will say, there are degrees to like how into the action you throw the characters. So like my most recent campaign, which Isaiah was in, uh, I did throw the characters in media res, but I was a little softer with the in media res than I have been in the past. So the characters were like thrown in jail. And they got a little bit of time to interact with each other in jail, but there was still something kind of going on because they were still a little confused. Like, why are we in this jail? Who's this warden dude talking to us? Why does he seem so over the top? And then shortly after that little bit in jail, weird stuff started to happen. The jail cell opened on its own. The guards were missing. You know, spookiness is going on. Then they're getting attacked by weird monsters. So I I have a question for you. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. 
Would you technically argue that every campaign should start in media res in some way, shape or form? I right? think like, so. Think about the tavern thing. Yes, I think like, so. Uh, the best way of starting in media res and tavern, right, is you give the description of the tavern. You, you know, you look to all your players and go, you have, you know, you have assembled as an adventuring party. But you've come to one major issue. You're all flat broke. What do you do? Right now, the players know, oh, we're broke. We need money. We're in a tavern. People meet in a tavern. We should try to talk to people. You know what I mean? Uh, and then you, they go, was well, yeah, that's the lowest level, basically. Yeah, I like, don't. I think that that's not quite meteor. I think that needs a little bit more of a nudge, which is to say, uh, you're in the tavern. You know, you're flat broke. You know that people pick up jobs in this tavern. Like, give them a little bit more of a nudge, or you see oh, a yeah, job board yeah, yeah. on the far end of there the room, go. or something like that. Just because the real thing is, they need something that mm. they can directly. Like they need something actionable that they can do immediately, you know, something to just get the ball rolling straight off the jump. But yeah, I, I think mm. basically everything should start in media res. I don't see. I can't really think there might be a scenario, but I cannot think of a reason why you wouldn't do that in your campaign. Like, I can't think of any reason to start things you know, to start things quiet and like serene and just nothing's really going down. You know what I mean? Like, I just can't see any reason to do that, especially because at the end of the day, especially when you're talking about a game like D&D, where your characters are presumably sort of heroes of some nature, or if not heroes, they're still the the heroic-esque protagonists. You know, heroes are reactive. Villains are active. So if you don't give the heroes a thing to react to they're not going to do anything because there's no villain to act against you know if you think about it if there were no bad guys captain america wouldn't put on the suit and grab his shield to go beat the fuck out of them because he has no reason to go beat the he's not going to go beat the fuck out of random bystanders right so it's like villains are always active so that's kind of what the in media res is doing it's saying characters you are here the villain is doing this and the villain can be, you know, could be anything. Villain is sort of a stand in statement, because like you said, all the players being flat broke, the villain is, you know, the economy at that point. <laughs> uh, yeah. But yeah, I, I yeah. Long and short. I can't think of a scenario where you wouldn't want to start in media res to some degree. And like like you just said, there are dials to it. You know, you could tune it up or down to the degree of action. Something like Star Wars is like heavily in media res. Like the action is not only has the action already started, the action's been going on for a little while when you when you know Star Wars starts up, presumably they've been chasing the Rebel Cruiser for a while. Um I'm I'm trying to think of like another like another example that's Oh, well, actually, here's a good you want to like a recent example of a, a much softer in media res, but still fairly in media res. Uh, the first episode of Avatar. Right. Sokka yeah. and Katara. We, you know, we don't really know anything about these characters. They're on screen. We know we learn very quickly. They're brother and sister. They're arguing with each other a little bit. And then they find Aang in the iceberg. There's not necessarily anything immediately bad happening but stuff is happening, right? Aang comes out of this iceberg and it's like this crazy glowing light shoots up in the air and the characters are like, what the hell? So like, there's something going on there. And then fairly shortly after that, we see the Fire Nation ships and the Fire Nation ships see the big beam of light in the sky and we know, oh, something's about to happen relatively soon. You know, so that's a, that is, I would say, a softer in media res. But by the end of that first episode, the Fire Nation are attacking already. You know, it's not like they it's not like the first episode goes by and you don't see the Fire Nation like they show up. So I'm it's trying to think of the, you know, the lowest in media res I can think of off the top of my head is probably Reservoir Dogs, hilariously enough. I mean, I haven't watched that movie, so. So the, the movie starts with them at, at a diner and they're like discussing the plan for the heist. But it, they're still in media res, right? They're like, you can like the DM could have basically been like, you're discussing the heist. You're figure going, out who has what nickname, and you're like, about to do. Yeah, you're about to do a heist. Yeah, 
figure out what your code names are going to be. And that's when that's like, you know, I'm Mr. Brown. Master Brown sounds like Mr. Shit. Mr. Pink sounds like Mr. Pussy. Like it's a whole like it's like a 15 minute bit, but they're technically in media res, right? They are actively discussing the thing that they're about to do. And then when that stops, they get up and then the, they do like the they do the reservoir dogs walk like the, that thing. And then it hard cuts to after the heist has gone horribly wrong. Spoilers if you haven't seen. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, we we might be technically uh, playing with the definition a little bit incorrectly here. Like we might be being a little too loose with it. But yeah, that's the general idea there. Sort of, but it's, it's sort of on purpose. The idea is like, even in a tavern, there are still things going on. It can't yeah. be like, you wouldn't be in a tavern for no reason. Even if the reason is to hang out with your friends, that's a reason. Now, it's not a great reason for a D&D &D adventuring a good reason party for D &D, unless yeah. they've like just finished a job. Yeah. But but even like, if they unless just, they just finished, finished a job, job and they I went was... to a bar and then I was going to say you have to give them more, right? Like let's say you just yeah. finished a job but then someone stole your money. That's that is where you immediately kick off. You're like we got to fucking find this guy, you know? Or you just finish a job, you all sit down, you're hanging out, and then someone spooky and mysterious comes up to your table and sits down and is like, hey, I would like to have a chat with you. For no, crap yeah. like that. But again, the strider, <laughs> right? Spooky man in the corner is like, you, what are you doing? I always think of it, like, I think about the last episode where we were like, people don't get that strider cares a lot. That's why he's so cool. Like, I mean, yeah. Aragorn cares a lot. That's why yes. Aragorn's a badass because he he's basically Aragorn in Lord of the Rings is like the first 30 minutes of the movie. It's just a fucking tsundere. Like, yes, he really pretends, pretends not to care, but he cares a lot. Uh, I mean, yes, for the non weebs, that might be a confusing comparison, but yes, I agree. Hmm. All right. Yeah, I think I, I think that's pretty much all I had. Yeah. A good time. About them Yankees. Uh, it all about the Mets, baby. <laughs> it's all about the Mets. Right. Uh, we'll throw. I'll throw the, the the document in our in the description if anyone wants to read it and kind of get a feel for what I'm talking about. Apologies if it's like complete gobbledygook. Uh, I don't think it. I mean, it. It's not that bad, but it's a little scattered because I wrote this, like I said, in a fugue state. Um. Yeah, be sure to follow us. Uh, leave a comment if you can subscribe do do all that jazz um, thanks for coming out I guess <laughs> it's crazy without Matt it's still crazy it, it, it's still nothing but chaos what happened why is it like this because <laughs> uh, you wrote your did we just assume the state? nonsense I did even even then like the chaos has just just followed us I, I think that was the main perpetrator here hmm <laughs> You know what? In in three weeks' time, when it's my turn again, we we'll see. We'll see what happens. <laughs> okay. Ch challenge accepted? Question mark. Challenge accepted! Exclamation point. <laughs> okay. All right. Goodbye, internet. Forever. Peace, motherfuckers. I'm moving Back to space. forever. I'm moving into space. Oh. The moon. Are you gonna? Are you gonna get a cool robot? I hope so.